Welcome to Truth for Transformation. I am Timothy Brown, and I am delighted that you decided to study God's Word with us today. I want to encourage you to go and take your Bibles out. We are going to go through God's Word verse by verse today. And I also want to invite you to share this with your friends and family and like this page. We want to get God's Word out around the world, changing lives one life at a time. Let's prepare our hearts for God's Word. Father, we thank you that your Word is truth and that your Word has the power to change our lives. So Father, as we look into your Word, speak to our hearts and help this be a day where the truth changes our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Hope everyone is doing well. We want to welcome you to Radiant Church. I'm Timothy. I'm one of the pastors here. Greetings to those who are watching online. We are starting a brand new summer series called Put Your Yes on the Table. Each summer, we like to put a little pause in our current through the book series, through the Bible series, and give you guys a little summer series. So this series is going to be asking you some questions each week. And today's question is, have you surrendered your entire life to Jesus. Go ahead and turn to Romans 12. As you turn there, I want to thank you guys for uh, praying for us while we were away. We had a great vacation. We uh, went to uh, New Smyrna Beach, which is in Edgewater, Florida. For those of you not familiar with that, it's near Daytona. Special thanks to my friend Rick and his wife Elise for letting us stay at their home. So we, we did a lot of fishing off their dock and uh, caught some unusual fish, a lot of catfish. Caught a few stingrays, and the most unusual fish we caught was a puffer fish. How many of you have ever caught in a puffer fish? I didn't know how to take it off the line. I was afraid the barbs would get me, so I just, I just cut it. So maybe after service, tell me how to take a puffer fish off. I don't know. So we, we had a really good time eating at different restaurants and going to the beach and just spending time as a family. But there was one story that I will never forget. It has to do with my son Lincoln here on the front row. I told him the stories about you this week. So we went to get ready for dinner. So we went out to a restaurant to eat. And all the kids, one by one, started jumping out of her 12-passenger van. Every single one got out. And Lincoln was the last one to get out. And when I saw Lincoln, I was taken aback and I was speechless. And I, I called my wife over. Lincoln was covered and looked like multicolored glue all over his body. And I'm like, how could this happen? And we just went down the road to this, to this restaurant. And my wife basically said, this is the gummies that you bought us for the trip. So I bought this 50 pack. There's the pack of gummies. And they were really good on the way to Florida. But while they were in Florida, the Florida sun melted the gummies. So Lincoln, being very hungry from a three-mile journey to the restaurant, decided to start opening the packs and smeared it all over his body. So I found myself in a conundrum. He can't go to inside the restaurant because he looks like he's from another planet, like gummy galaxies or something, and they're not going to let him in. So I, I had a predicament, so I was like, well, the only thing I can do is y'all go ahead and eat. I'm going to take him through a drive through We're going to get to go. We're going to eat, and then I'm going to de-gummify him so that way everyone can be okay. So I take him home, and uh, we, he gets all the gummies off. Of, and what I didn't realize is the gummies were all over the car. And so on our way home, so that the gummies didn't continue, it took me up to two hours to clean off the gummies. So as I was preparing our, our vehicle to come home, a thought occurred to me that this was not in vain, but this was going to turn into a sermon illustration, as they often do. And you're like, how can you get an illustration out of gummies? Well, here it is. God has called us to be sticky saints. Sticky saints. See, gummies are sweet and they're sticky. As Christians, we're called to be sweet, right? Loving, kind. 
but you're also called to be sticky. See, after you've eaten gummies, there's an after-do residual effect, a stickiness. So when people are around you, you should stick on their minds. When people have spent time with you, God through you, the Holy Spirit living through you, produces a stickiness where it's like it's a residual effect. So today in Romans 12, we're going to revisit this passage. I'll try to take you this at least once a year. This is kind of the centerpiece of what Christian living is, Romans 12, is how to be more sticky. So today I want to tell you how to be a sticky saint. You're going to walk away a little, a little sticky and it's going to be interesting. So Romans 12, and again, greetings to those watching online. Today's big question is, have you truly surrendered your entire life to Jesus? Romans 12, starting in verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. So notice he's talking to believers. These are not lost people he's talking to. He's talking to church people. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Or he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray over God's word. Father, we want to be totally surrendered saints. We want to be Christians that leave a mark on the world. So Lord, as we talk about what it looks like to be totally surrendered, we pray that we'd walk away from this message with our yes on the table. Yes, God, I will be fully surrendered to you. So Lord, we pray your blessing to be upon this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today I want to give you three traits of what it means to be fully surrendered to God. These are ways to become sticky saints, if you will. The first, me, the first trait is this. A surrendered life is a living worship service. So when you, when you say, therefore, my brethren, in Romans 12, 1, when you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? So what I want to do, we don't have time to go into all of Romans, but I want to summarize the first 11 chapters with this. Romans 1 through 3 teaches that we are all sinners. If you read Romans 1 through 3, you walk away saying, listen, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we all need forgiveness. Romans 4 and 5 teaches that just like Abraham, we are saved or justified by faith alone. Romans 6 and 7 teaches that you've been set free from sin, so you're now married to Christ. And when you're married to Christ, you're no longer under the law. You're now married to Christ. Romans 8 teaches there is no condemnation. So if you are in Christ, all of your sins have been forgiven. There's no one that can accuse you of guilty. You stand before God innocent because of Jesus. Romans 9 through 11 teaches that God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. And because he has a plan, you can trust his sovereignty. You can trust that his plan and his purposes will prevail. So when you get to Romans 12, 1, and it says, therefore, what is the therefore, therefore, by God's mercy. That means because God has been so good to you, he saved you when you were a sinner. You were lost, but now you're found. You were blind, but now you see. Therefore, because of God's mercy, Present your body as a living sacrifice. In other words, it's the only logical response for God laying his whole self down through the person of Jesus. Therefore, in view of what God has done, present your body as a living sacrifice. 
A sacrifice of the Old Testament would be something that they would bring to the priest and they would offer and once they slit the neck of the goat or the sheep or whatever it may be, that sheep offering, they were dead. It was dead. But what Paul says is now you're not to be a dead sacrifice, you're to be a living sacrifice. And you're like, what's a living sacrifice? Well, we have to go back to Jesus' perfect sacrifice. Whenever Jesus died on the cross, he died one time for all the sins of all time so that whoever receives that sacrifice, they are forgiven. And when Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice, he changed the nature of sacrifices. So now God doesn't ask for a dead sacrifice, he asks for living sacrifices. He wants all of you to lay yourself on the altar and to be fully surrendered. I can remember when I was five, that's when I gave God my yes card for salvation. I said, yes, save me. I realized that I was a sinner, I needed forgiveness. That was yes for salvation. But I did not realize at the time that Jesus doesn't wanna just be Lord, he also, not only Savior, but he also wants to be Lord. See, I knew Jesus is Savior, but I had not surrendered to his Lordship. So at the age of 14, I put my yes card. And I look at it back now as like a blank check. This is how I describe it. Whenever you surrender your life, you give God a blank check and you sign your name to it. And you say, God, wherever you want me to go, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. And I can't say no, Lord, because no and Lord do not go together. It's always yes, Lord. So part of the inspiration of this series is while I was in Florida, one of the ladies of the church I was visiting, she got up and she told a story how God had called her family to do some things. And she originally said, no, Lord. She didn't want to do it. Her husband didn't want to do it. She didn't want to do it but God kept prompting her to be obedient. And finally she said, yes, Lord. She put her yes on the table. So I wanna encourage you through this whole series, each Sunday for the next six weeks, we're gonna ask you to put your yes card on the table. In weeks past, I brought up a, a figure in church history from the 17th century called Brother Lawrence. He's originally from France and Every time I think of surrender, I think of Brother Lawrence. For those of you who've never heard of him, he wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. And Brother Lawrence did the most mundane things, like he worked in the kitchen of this monastery and he would peel potatoes, he would wash dishes. And he came to the conclusion that if I peel potatoes and I wash dishes and I pick up trash, if I do it in the presence of God and for the glory of God, it's an act of worship. So it's possible to live your life like a living worship service when you're in the presence of God. And by the way, God is everywhere present. There's nowhere you can go where he's not. So it's acknowledging his presence. When we come to church, we invite the presence of God knowing that his presence is already here. We acknowledge that it's it's here. We want to experience his presence. So I wanna ask you, have you laid your yes card on the table? And this is the power of yes, that this is in your listening guide. When I surrender my life to Jesus and his purposes, God sees this as a living worship to him. Have you done that? Have you put your yes on the table? Jesus is asking all of you. So over here, I've got this little table, and I'm gonna move this down here. Dakota, can I hand this down to you? I wanna drop it. If you'll notice in your listening guide, for those of you who are listening on I put a little card in your, in your bulletin. And what I want you to do is at the end of the service, I'm gonna have you write yes on a card. You can use a pen here. And I, I, want, you to, I want you to put it on the table at the end of the service saying yes. And the reason why is that when God calls you you lay your yes on the table. So God, I want to live my life like a living worship service. I don't want to just go to church because here's the thing. Here's a slogan of the surrender. You don't go to church to worship. You go to church worshiping. You're like, what's the difference? Well, if I go to church to worship, it takes me about like three songs to finally get into it. And by the fourth song, everyone's standing, they're into it. That's going to church to worship. But if I come to church worshiping, Sunday is an overflow of my life, Monday through Saturday. 
So don't come to church simply to worship. Come to church worshiping. So have you put your yes on the table? I encourage you to do so. Truth number two, what does it look like to be completely surrendered? What is it like to be a sticky saint? Number two, a surrendered life looks differently, drastically differently from those who are living in the world. Paul goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world. That word conform, it has the idea of don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So many of us allow the world to make us into its image. So many of us allow the world to tell us how to think, how to act, how to behave. But the only thing that should tell us is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are only under his authority, not under anything else. So he says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Instead, be transformed. Someone say the word transformed. If we want to be transformed, Paul says we have to renew our mind. Part of renewal means getting rid of certain thinking. Some of us struggle from stinking thinking. And you're like, well, what's stinking thinking? I'll give you a few examples of worldly thinking. How many of us are more influenced and affected by like CNN or Fox or a news network than we are the Bible? We can watch the news, but the news should not drive us or dictate our thinking. The Word of God should. Some of us, it's a critical attitude. Last time I checked, a critical spirit was not a gift of the Spirit, right? How many of you have ever met anybody that was a critic? They complained and criticized everything. That, as, I haven't found that as one of the gifts in the Bible. So you've got to re- lay aside critical. It doesn't mean you can't be rational or logical, but if you're always criticizing everything, You've got to be a part of the solution, not as part of the problem. We've got to renew our minds. So a preview over the next five following weeks, we're going to talk about how to do that. Today we're talking about surrendering your life. Next Sunday, a little preview, enjoy time with Jesus daily. What would happen if you spent quality time with Jesus every day? Yes, number three is connect with community weekly. We're going to talk about the power of community that we gather in rows, but we connect in circles. Week four is give intentionally and cheerfully that whatever you have, it's God's, and we're gonna give back to him. Week five is build up the church using my gifts. Did you know that you're exceptionally gifted? Look at the person next to you and say, you're gifted. You are gifted. So how are we gonna use this to build up the body of Christ? And yes, number six is tell others about Jesus. When we do that, We're putting our yes on the table. Yes, God, I'm gonna do this. So Paul says in the next verse, verse three, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Well, why is that? He goes on to explain that you should not have prideful thinking because anything good you have, if you got it, God gave it. So some people will say, well, Timothy, I have a good job. I've made a lot of money. I've been successful. Well, guess what? If God didn't breathe out, you wouldn't breathe in. If God didn't give you that mind to think and to work and the ability to, to, to have a career, you wouldn't have it. So anything good you have, if you got it, God gave it. So in the context of spiritual gifts, Paul says that everything we have is through the grace given to us. Every spiritual gift is a grace gift. What does that mean? It means you didn't work for it, you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it. God gave it to you, and it wasn't primarily to build you up, it was primarily to build the body of Christ up, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So he says, through the grace given to every man among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but soberly as God has dealt to each person a measure of faith. In the movie Chariots of Fire, it tells about two Olympic runners. One is Eric Liddell and the other one is Harold Abrahams. Now, Eric Liddell was a person that was raised by missionaries. His parents were missionaries and he had a completely different mindset than the other runners, including Mr. Abrahams. Eric Liddell decided that he was gonna run fast and he was gonna run for the glory of God. His dad says, run as fast as you can for the glory of God so the whole world will watch you in awe. So Eric Liddell had a crisis of 
of, of belief and uh, conviction at one moment because they, they decided in the Olympic Games of 1924 that he was going to have to run on Sunday. And his personal conviction was that's the Lord's day. I'm going to worship. I'm going to go to church. I'm not going to neglect God and leave his house and go running. That was his personal conviction. So he decided not to. And all of the leaders of his country begged him, please, you've you got to do this. Do this for your country. You're going to let your country down. And he said, I'm going to honor the Lord above people. So he decided not to. So his teammate, Mr. Abrahams, ran and actually won the 100-meter run. He actually won. But for him, it was about self-gratification, self-glory. So you go back to Eric. He decided he was going to run the 400-meter run. And he was not very gifted at the 400 meter in comparison to the 100. In fact, in the qualifying round, he barely made it. He was not projected to win or place in the top, but he had people praying for him. And Eric Liddell ran for the glory of God and he ran really fast and guess what happened? He not only won the gold, but he broke a world record. And that Sunday before he ran, he preached on a scripture, Isaiah 40. It says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, what's amazing about Eric Liddell that I did not know, but the year after the Olympics, after he did the Olympics in 1924, in the year 1925, he went on the mission field. And he decided to devote the rest of his life on the mission field. And what's, what's just fascinating is that in China where he served, it got very dangerous and the government, the British government, told Liddell to go back to his home country because they were going to they were going to put him in prison, possibly concentration camp. But he stayed, and because he stayed, he surrendered his life. And in the year 1945, he got some type of brain tumor, which took his life. And his last words were, "It's a complete surrender." It's a complete surrender. Now, you're like, Timothy, that's anticlimactic. You win the gold one year, the next year you go to China, and then eventually you die of a brain tumor. But for Eric Liddell, his life was not his own because he had to put his yes on the table to God. God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Because even if you live to be 100 years old, it's a short life compared to eternity. And Eric Liddell, being in heaven now for some time, he does not regret his decision to not seek personal fame and glory, but to live for the glory of God, amen? So the power of yes, when I surrender my life to Jesus and his purposes, my life will look drastically different from the world. So should yours. So I ask you, have you put your yes on the table? Have you put all of you on the altar as a living sacrifice? If not, put your yes on the table today. Truth number three, a surrendered life is living for greater purpose than yourself. In verses four through eight, Paul says, as we have many members in one body, but all members have, do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So what he's gonna present here is that as a church, we are interdependent upon each other. We're not independent. So when, when someone says to you, I don't need church, I worship at home, I worship online, you know, me and my spouse have Bible study, so that's good, but that's not the New Testament definition of church. New Testament definition of church is when believers assemble together. It doesn't have to be in a building, but when they come together, use their spiritual gifts to build each other up and to worship God, that's church. So we live in a world today where people don't wanna commit to church. But when you read through the New Testament, I can't find a single example of someone that's a Christian that's not also part of a local church. Uh, a, a Christian without a church is a spiritual orphan, and you don't find that in the New Testament. They're all part of a body. So Paul breaks down this truth that you are gifted, and God has gifted you for a purpose greater than yourself. So I just wanna encourage all of you that you are here on planet Earth in the year 2023, not just to take up time and space, but to have a part in something that's bigger and greater than yourself. In 1 Peter 4.10, Peter says it like this, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the mercies of God. So here's a slogan of the surrender, my life is not about me. 
My life is about God and it's about others. It's about building up the body, the church. And one of my favorite sayings is, if you're not serving, you're swerving. So Paul lists seven gifts in the church. There's many more, but he lists seven broad categories. The first one is prophecy. A lot of times you think of prophecy, you think of someone predicting the future, and it does involve that. But the majority role of the prophet is a teaching gift. So this encompasses many different teaching gifts, speaking God's word, revealing God's word in a particular situation. So Paul tells us if you have the gift of prophecy, he says prophesy in proportion to your faith. In other words, preach within the confines of scripture and preach to the edges of the faith that God, God gives you. All right, so ministry, what's ministry? This is the Greek word diakonos, and it sounds like the word what? Deacon. And this is men and women in the church who have a gift of serving. These are people who have a variety of gift. It, it's like a gift of helps, and you are there to fill in needs and fill in the gaps where it's needed. So Paul says, if you have that gift, serve. Use it for the glory of God. Teaching. Teaching is the ability to interpret clarify, systematize, and cl explain God's word clearly. So if you have the gift of teaching, teach with the ability that God gives you. And it brings up a question, an FAQ that people ask, what is the difference between preaching and teaching? How many have ever asked that question? You hear someone yelling and going off and you're like, that's good preaching. You hear someone break down a scripture and you say, that person's a great teacher. Well, let me explain the difference. Preaching is telling someone what to do from the Bible. So preaching is here's what you should do, what to do. Teaching is telling them how to do it from scripture. So the preacher says, you must, that's preaching. And the teacher says, here's how. So here's an example. A preacher's like, you need to be a good husband, you need to be a good wife, amen. A teacher comes in and tells you how to do it. So in a church, you need both. So example, in my sermons, when I say you, that's preaching, when I tell you how to do it, that's teaching. So you need both preaching and teaching. All right, exhorting. Exhorting is telling others how to follow God, how to encourage them in the Lord. And when they go astray, the person has the gift of exhortation, they try to have that come to Jesus talk. How many of you have ever had a come to Jesus talk with somebody? And that's called exhorting, exhortation. It's like, here's God's will. I want to encourage you, but if you go astray and you don't listen to encouragement, I'm going to give you a gentle rebuke. That's the exhorter. All right, giving. Now, this brings up a conundrum. I thought all Christians are to be generous, right? We are. So what is this gift of giving? If we're all to be generous, what is this gift of giving? Well, it has kind of twofold application. Jesus points to the widow who gave what little she had, and he said she, she gave sacrificially. So it's not necessarily the amount. So it, it can be what little you have giving sacrificially. And the other side is God gives some people the gift to be able to create businesses and to create wealth. And it's not just to increase their standard of living, it's also to increase their standard of giving. And I've met throughout, I've been in ministry 25 years and almost in every church I've served in, there have been a handful of people that had this gift to create wealth, and they used it not just to benefit themselves, but to benefit the church. I'll give you an example. Recently, two weeks ago, I said, guys, we don't have money to, for VBS this year. The kids are going to go without T-shirt. And two people that had the gift of giving said, we're going to come through. And guess what? Two people gave $3,200 so we have VBS cover this year. Amen? That's the gift of giving. You can give God a hand for that. That's really exciting. So that's, when someone sees that, they step in and they help. All right, the gift of leadership. Leadership is seeing where the people are and seeing where God wants them to be, the preferred future. So a leader takes people from point A to point B. In my estimation, probably 10% or less of the church have the gift of leadership. But you recognize that people have leadership. You know how? You see a crowd around them. They're always leading a pack of people. Those are the leaders in the church. So Paul says, if you have the gift of leadership, you better lead. Because if you're not leading, who are people going to follow? That, that's stepping up. Now, one of my favorite gifts, Paul saved the best for last. Not the best, but the, sometimes the rare gift is the gift of mercy. 
I asked the first service to raise your hand if you have to get the mercy. Two people raised their hand in the audience. The gift of mercy is not just feeling sorry for someone, but it's feeling the pain with someone. It's not just sympathy, but it's empathy. It's being able to cry with them. It's being able to feel their pain. So second service, raise your, if you have the gift of mercy, raise your hand. Just be on our one, two, three, okay. Like a very small percentage still of the audience. So here's the thing, mercy is a special gift and it's just being able to, to, to be with someone and to feel their pain and help them through it. So let me give you an example. Pastor Joe Perry is sitting up front. So let's say he has a massive accident, okay? He drinks hot coffee and it spills and he has a ma major burn. He trips and falls and breaks a leg, okay? Could you guys see that happening? Okay, yeah, so he's in the hospital, broken leg, coffee burns. We can visualize this happening. So let, let's go through this gift list. Look back on your outline. So the prophet comes and he says, Joe, did you do anything that set this up? Like, is God trying to get your attention? <laughs> Maybe, maybe God's trying to, and Joe's like, I don't think so, brother, and you know, they're talking through it. The next person comes in the room to visit the hospital. They have the gift of ministry, and this is a lady in the church who said, Joe, the women's council has gone together, and we've made you this nice, fluffy pillow so you can prop your leg up, and it's, it, I'm sorry it's pink. It's the only color we had to work with, but it's a fluffy pillow, and we just want to be here for you. And then one of, the, one of the Radiant Group teachers comes in, and Joe, I'm so sorry we're here for you. My class is praying for you. Is there anything God's trying to teach you through this, Joe? Is any lessons you've learned while you're sitting in the hospital? So Joe's thinking through it. And then you have the exhorter come in, and he's trying to give Joe an encouragement. Brother, when you, when you get out of this hospital, you're going to be better than ever. That leg's going to heal up, and you're going to have this new pep in your step, and he's encouraging Joe. And then the person with giving comes in, and he finds out that Joe doesn't have the money to cover what the insurance does the cover, the deductible. And without Joe even knowing, the hospital says that we don't know how to explain this to you, but someone paid for your hospital bill. That's the person of giving. And then the person that has leadership is leading groups of people to come help Joe. They're like, hey, we got a mill train going and there's a bunch of people on board and hey, we're making sure Amy's taken care of while you're away. They're organizing groups of people. And then the merciful person comes in and they're holding Joe's hand by his bed and they're crying, Joe, I'm so sorry, man. The church is not the same without you. It's just not. And they're crying with Joe. And so you see how the gifts work together. So here's the question. If you have one of those gifts, what would the church be like without you? There would, be, there would be some major pieces missing. So here's, here's kind of the vision for this church. I wanna kind of close with this, is that God has us here at this time and place. And we've went through a name change, we've seen a lot of new people come to the church, and we're seeing God do things behind the scenes that can only be explained, it's God. You know, when I hear the things of like our students being come back from summer camp on fired, people getting saved, that's a God thing. When I see even little things like the yard sale and seeing all these people work together in unity and seeing the body organize and come together, it's a God thing. And I really believe, I just wanna encourage you with this, that sometimes God raises up churches that are community-based, sometimes they're local, sometimes they're regional, sometimes they're national, and sometimes they're international ministries. And I really feel like you guys here have a potential not just to impact this area or this region, but to touch the world. I really believe that. And God is working on that. So just, just a few weeks ago, I was talking to several visitors and I'm like, we have people from four counties coming to this church. There's Buncombe County, there's Henderson County, there's Haywood County, and there's Transylvania County. Just four counties coming here. And we have people from different states that are watching us online, even different countries. And God is beginning to open up doors for this church. And I just, I just want to give God a hand for that. That's, that's exciting. It's exciting. So I want to ask you, have you put your yes on the table? Have you put all of you for God's purposes? Today we've talked about three major points. Number one, a surrendered life is a living worship service. Are you living in the presence of God? Are you coming to church to worship? Or are you coming to church worshiping? Number two, a surrendered life looks vastly different from this world. When people look at you and see your character, 
Does it look like everybody else or are you very different from this world? Are you being conformed or are you being transformed? And a surrendered life is living for a greater purpose than yourself. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world and guess what, we are his body. So as we present Jesus to the world, the church presents the hope of Jesus to the world. So to summarize this into one sentence, to make it very simple, let's throw the big idea on the screen. Today, put your yes on the table for surrendering your entire life to Jesus. So in just a moment, we're gonna have a, a closing thought from Brother Scott and we're gonna close out the service. And as we leave, I want you guys to take that card that was in your, your worship guide and I wanna see some yeses put on the table. And if you wanna put your name on the back, you can. You can put your name on the back. If you don't wanna put your name on the back, you don't have to, but it would be great to see the yeses in this place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you gave your yes to send Jesus. And because Jesus came, he also gave his yes to die on the cross. And because Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit gave his yes to come to earth and to live inside the believers to form this church. So God, you've given us three yeses. And Father, I pray that we would give our yes today, that we would not just be saved, but we would be surrendered. So right now, I wanna talk to believers first, no one looking around. If you've never fully laid yourself on the altar as a living sacrifice, and we've talked about what that means, God, you have all of my life. Whatever you tell me, I will do it. I will live for you, not just on Sundays, but I'll live for you every day. I I just want you to tell God, I'm gonna do that right now. Say, God, I I give you my yes. Go ahead and tell him. And say, God, forgive me for holding back my yes. Forgive me for only knowing you as Savior, but not surrendering to you as Lord. As the believers continue to pray, there may be one here today that God is calling you to be saved. You've never really asked Jesus to save you, You've never turned from your sins in a way where people have seen a difference in your life. And if you're born again, your life will change. You are saved by faith alone, but true faith changes your life. So if you've never really invited Jesus in your life, I want you to say this prayer right where you're at. Say, Jesus, I realize that I need you to save me. I realize that I've held on to my sin, my lifestyle, my way of doing things, I've never really asked you to forgive me. So Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I do believe you died on the cross and you rose again. So Jesus, I make the decision to follow you starting today and for the rest of my life. Father, thank you for your grace and for your love. We give you our yes today. And all God's children said, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for Truth For Transformation. My prayer is that God's word resonates deep within your soul. My mission here at this ministry is to encourage and equip and empower you to reach your full God-given redemptive potential. If you would like to partner with this ministry, you can do so by going to our church website. That is radiant828.com. Our mission here is to get the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world in its various formats. We want to do this through preaching. We want to do this through writing books that are going to encourage people. And we want to do this through radio and television. So your partnership helps us to reach more lives. We hope that this was a blessing and we hope to see you next week.